Item number, SCP-218. Object class, Euclid. Special containment procedures. SCP-218 is contained within a standard aquatic specimen tank, saltwater. Tank maintenance is to be carried out by remote drone only. No further procedures are required. Description. SCP-218 is a predatory colonial organism, weighing approximately 1,800 kilograms, consisting of several hundred parasitic lampreys of the family Petromyzontidae, designated Petromyzon animalis. Individual Petromyzon animalis specimens average between 50 and 90 centimeters in length and are similar in appearance to the common sea lamprey, Petromyzon marinus, with the primary exception of complex ultraviolet spectrum skin patterning. Individual lampreys can break off from the primary mass and move under their own power, acting similar to non-anomalous specimens. These modal units will remain in the vicinity of SCP-218's primary body until captured and eaten by colony members. The central mass of SCP-218 contains the organism's primary organs, as well as a muscular foot for locomotion. SCP-218 is capable of surviving out of the water for up to an hour, though it is greatly inhibited in mobility. Modal units of SCP-218 produce a paralyzing toxin, applied by bite or through the lamprey's mucus sheath. This toxin inhibits locomotor muscles and will numb the target to pain. All other internal and mental processes will continue unaffected. The paralyzing effect has not been observed to dissipate, and no effective counteragent has yet been discovered. Early observation led researchers to believe that SCP-218 reproduced through the parasitic implantation of modal units into a host body. This behavior has since been determined to be atypical feeding behavior, where numerous modal units will burrow within the body of still-living prey for upwards of 48 hours before normal consumption resumes. Addendum 1 Physical examination of SCP-218 shortly after containment revealed that the primary mass contained several foreign objects, preserved within the main body cavity. SCP-218 was removed from its containment tank and tranquilized to allow for surgery. Objects removed from SCP-218 include 33 pearls, averaging 3 centimeters in diameter. Holes bored through each indicate that they were previously part of a necklace. One dolphin figurine carved out of smoothed coral two gold bracelets, four bone hair pins, one tortoise shell hair comb, one bone figurine of SCP-218, shows signs of heavy wear through handling, one human skeleton, being that of a female child, estimated to be between four and six years of age. Skeleton was similar to chalk in consistency and embedded with 135 pearls. Scapula believed to be that of a red deer, engraved with three humanoid figures, two adults, and one child, presumed to be the subject and parents. Both the skeleton and artifacts date to approximately 7500 BCE, though do not resemble the artifacts of other Neolithic groups in the region of recovery. Addendum 2 SCP-218's behavior became significantly more agitated after removal of the aforementioned objects entity would repeatedly beat against the walls of its tank or attempt to scale them. When one of the hairpins was placed back in the containment tank, SCP-218 used one of its colony members as a manipulator to retrieve the pin and then place it back inside its central cavity through the means of a large sphincter. This dorsal sphincter was not present until the removal of the body and artifacts. Item number SCP-366 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures All SCP-366 specimens, regardless of stage, are to be stored in a Level 4 Biological Hazard Freezing Unit at Biological Research Site 66. Cryopreservation is to be achieved through freezing in liquid nitrogen at a constant temperature of negative 196 degrees Celsius to prevent activation. Due to the diminutive nature of SCP-366 OVA, these specimens are to be stored in a near-vacuum Class III biosafety cabinet to avoid accidental dispersion, in addition to cryopreservation as outlined above. All specimens and infested hosts are only to be handled by authorized personnel wearing Level A hazmat suits with SCBA 
and all personnel involved in the handling of SCP-366 are to be scanned by MRI for possible infestation before entering and after exiting containment facilities. If an infestation is detected, specific procedures are to be followed depending on the sex of the host. Males are to be detained and subjected to a dual inguinal orchiectomy by resident level 3 or higher medical staff. All medical offal is to be disposed of according to the hasb inf 142 b protocol. A secondary scan for infestation is to be performed after recovery and quarantine to verify the success of the procedure and to rule out residual infestation. Females found to have suffered infestation are to be likewise detained and placed in quarantine under medical observation 24 hours per day until such time as an ABE-366 event occurs. Should signs of an imminent ABE-366 event be detected, the host is to be sedated using benzodiazepines, the dosage to be determined by the resident head of medical staff. The host's quarantine cell is then to be evacuated of all personnel. Due to the dangers of hearing loss, immediate containment of SCP-366 specimens exiting the host's body is essential. Post-event, both the host and any affected personnel are to be screened for continued infestation and treated accordingly. If no such infestation is detected and the host survived, Class A amnestics may be administered and the host need no longer be detained. No special social reintegration procedures apply. As locations where SCP-366 OVA are deposited shift if sealed off permanently, containment of these areas focuses on detection quarantine of hosts, and containment of specimens. If celestial events known to trigger the appearance of SCP-366 OVA can be foreseen, sites are to be closed down temporarily. If need be, OVA may be harvested for research. In all other situations, OVA are to be allowed to expire before sites are declared open again. If infestation is detected outside of Foundation control, hosts are to be detained and subjected to the stipulations above. The procedures outlined above are then to be applied to locations linked to these cases. Critical infestations occurring outside of the Foundation's control warrant a full quarantine of all individuals in contact with the deceased. If necessary, temporary research and detainment sites are to be established around large-scale hot zones. Description SCP-366 refers to a human endoparasite of unknown, possibly extraterrestrial origin that starts its life cycle in an ovum stage. In male hosts, ova can develop into a larval stage. In female hosts, larval stage specimens may transition to the adult stage. Larvae introduced to male hosts and ova introduced to female hosts live at most three hours before expiring due to a lack of the hormones necessary for their further development. Attempts to cultivate infestations in other organisms have not yet yielded any results, with SCP-366 specimens of any stage expiring as expected when outside a human host. Ova measure approximately one micrometer in diameter and have never been recovered unfertilized. When encountered outside of a host, ova are dormant, with the embryo in developmental stasis. Larvae measure between 0.1 and 0.2 millimeters and display physical characteristics of the larva of Ocleratatus cantato. Despite this resemblance, research has indicated no DNA matches with that species, nor any of its family. Adult SCP-366 specimens resemble the larva of Tenebrio molitor, though they are significantly larger, 9.3 centimeters to 14.8 centimeters. Again, this resemblance is superficial only. Upon introduction of SCP-366 OVA to a male host via inhalation or ingestion, specimens travel through the body to settle in the testes. An ovum stage specimen monitors its host's testosterone levels for between 27 to 32 days. After that period of time, any significant increase in testosterone over the usual levels will trigger a transition to larval stage. SCP-366 larvae lie dormant in the testes, waiting to be transmitted to a female host. Symptoms that male hosts may display at this time include muscle pains, fevers, and a small amount of blood in the host's urine. 
Larva developed in male hosts are transmitted to female hosts through ejaculation. If ejaculation does not occur, larval stage specimens will remain in the host system indefinitely, waiting to be transferred to a female host. Lifespan has not as of yet been established for these larvae. SCP-366 infestation in female hosts occurs after unprotected copulation with infested males. Larva transmitted in this manner attach to the lining of the uterus and feed on the host's output of 17 beta estradiol to grow to their adult form. An infestation with adult specimens produces symptoms resembling pregnancy, which may include nausea, a swelling of the abdominal area, light blood loss in stool or vaginal fluids, abdominal cramps, during this gestation period, the SCP-366 specimens present in the uterus will display ovophagous behavior, with the larger and stronger specimens killing and assimilating weaker ones. This process continues until only one specimen survives. After three to six weeks, the remaining adult specimen leaves the host in an ABE-366 event. Specimens birthed in this manner will take flight through unknown means and attempt to gain access to the open sky. If successful, specimens will ascend towards the system at an average rate of 114 kilometers an hour. Research using tracking devices attached to birthed specimens has yielded little result, with specimens lost in the vicinity of Specimens prevented from reaching the open sky will produce a sustained high-pitched sound at approximately 101 decibels. An infestation is designated critical if abnormally elevated levels of 17 beta estradiol in males cause larval stage specimens to develop into adult stage prematurely. These cases are invariably fatal to the host, as large numbers of immature adult stage specimens leave the host's body in an abrupt mass exodus. There was only one recorded critical infestation amongst infested males in Foundation custody. SCP-366 ovum stage specimens can be found exclusively in the state of Massachusetts, always at exposed locations known locally for adolescent sexual activity. Certain celestial events, such as meteor showers, may trigger the descent of SCP-366 ova. The amount of ova deposited during these events ranges from approximately 1.000 to 10.000 depending on the level of activity at the location. The exact origin of the ova remains untraceable at this point. Addendum 366A1 It was so beautiful, man. Just me, Lorraine, the night sky, and all those falling stars. Host 366-28289F Deceased Item Number SCP-378 Object Class Thaumiel Notice from the Foundation Records and Information Security Administration Following the implementation of the Kraken Protocol on 2706-1963, containment procedures for SCP-378 have been updated. Personnel assigned to the SCP-378 project are to review its updated documentation as soon as possible. Claudia Southey, Director, Risa Special Containment Procedures SCP-378 is to be contained in a subterranean entity containment terrarium. Temperature and humidity are to be maintained at levels optimal for the growth and habitation of Heterodermia cane crow, Utica cave lichen, and Prenolepis everettman, North American cave ant. Twice per year, SCP-378 is to undergo a medical and psychological examination. Access to SCP-378's containment terrarium is separated from the surrounding facility by a decontamination chamber. Handling personnel are required to wear full body protection and must be screened for SCP-378-A prior to exiting decontamination. Infected personnel are to be terminated unless the position of SCP-378-1 or 3 is vacant, in which case they are to be assigned to the relevant position instead. As of the adoption of the Kraken Protocol, SCP-378's containment is focused on maintaining its three primary containment components. SCP-378-1 is housed in the Area 19 barracks. SCP-378-1 is employed as a maintenance technician with a security clearance of O-A19. 
Upon the death of the current SCP-3781, brain-dead or comatose reserve personnel may be elected to replace it. As SCP-3781 is the primary means of communication with SCP-378, care must be maintained to keep SCP-3781's vocal functions in working order. SCP-3782 currently takes the form of David Lockheed, a 36-year-old Caucasian male and the employee of the American Supernatural Containment Initiative, ASCII, as a clerical aide, to maintain the continued operations of the SCP Foundation in the United States. SCP-3782 has been tasked with sabotaging ASCII operations against the Foundation, as well as collecting information in the Foundation's interests. SCP-3782 is expected to follow a strict health and exercise regimen due to the inherent difficulty in replacing it. SCP-3783 currently takes the form of Lisa Martin, a 33-year-old Mexican-American female employee at the Spicy Crust Pizza in Staten Island. In the event of SCP-3783's death, it must be replaced as soon as possible. Each component is fitted with a tracking device and an audio recorder. Each week, embedded agents stationed near each component are to evaluate the health and integrity of each component and its associated surveillance equipment. The utilization of SCP-378-A in further infiltration is pending Foundation Overwatch approval. Description SCP-378 is an arthropod, superficially resembling a deformed larval instance of Scolopendra gigantea, the Amazonian giant centipede. SCP-378's legs are largely vestigial, primarily meant to assist in peristaltic locomotion. SCP-378 measures 3 meters from mouth to anus, with a bodily thickness of 1 meter and a weight of 233 kilograms. Under normal conditions, SCP-378 is an omnivore, with a diet consisting primarily of lichen and insects. SCP-378 is capable of asexual reproduction at will, producing instances of SCP-378-A from its anus. Instances of SCP-378-A resemble adult Scolopendra gigantea. Dissection suggests this resemblance is superficial, as SCP-378-A lack expected organ systems beyond a primitive neural network. Instances of SCP-378-A are controlled remotely by SCP-378. SCP-378-A are obligate endoparasites, infecting advanced primates such as humans, Homo ignotus, Data Expunged, and Gigantopithecus sapiens, Common Sasquatch. Upon infection, SCP-378-A integrates itself with its host's nervous system through poorly understood means, inducing brain death and extending SCP-378's remote control to the host itself. Vital functions and sensory input remain unaffected. Upon infecting a suitable host, SCP-378 will attempt to reintegrate its hosts into their respective species' social sphere. Once integrated, SCP-378 directs its hosts to indefinitely engage in the behaviors typical for its species, such as communal labor and social recreation. Human hosts prefer environments with a high population density and a robust entertainment scene. The upper limit of active hosts SCP-378 can maintain at any one time is unknown. Upon initial interrogation, SCP-378 confessed to the existence of 26 human hosts, as well as two instances of Aluata Pigra, Guatemalan Black Howler, and three instances of SCP-1000, of which it noted had been acquired during a period of heavy intoxication. Addendum 178-294-B A Psychological Evaluation of SCP-378 Conducted by Dr. Simon Glass Tentatively designated Scolopendra Animalia, SCP-378 is unique among arthropods, possessing either human levels of sapience or the ability to emulate its host's intellectual faculties. In any case, SCP-378 is self-aware and remarkably intelligent. SCP-378's relationship to its hosts is complicated. While SCP-378 maintains a consistent sense of identity across multiple hosts, each is treated as a persona for SCP-378 to roleplay. Hosts rarely interact with SCP-378 or fellow hosts, suggesting SCP-378 primarily utilizes its anomalous abilities for entertainment. 
This is further suggested by SCP-378's readiness to abandon such personas under duress. Aside from integration into human social spheres, host behavior is largely unique to each instance. Extroversion is relatively common. Hosts rarely isolate themselves except to sleep or excrete. SCP-378 appears to take equal enthusiasm in stressful versus pleasant situations. Of note, SCP-378 is particularly attached to the identity of Lisa Martin. In contrast to other hosts, Lisa Martin's weekly routine is relatively static. From 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. on all days except Saturday, Miss Martin will show up to work at the nearest pizzeria from the former location of Digian Antonio's Pies, regardless of employment status or scheduled hours. From 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. on all days except Saturday, Miss Martin will engage in the maintenance of one of 17 rooftop gardens across the city of New York. Of these, 13 are maintained by a cooperative, 12 of which Miss Martin is not a part of. From 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. on Saturdays, Miss Martin alternates between socializing with a collection of friends, co-workers, and lovers, and playing piano for various high-end bars. From 11 p.m. to 12 a.m., Miss Martin will shower and prepare for bed. Miss Martin will sleep from 12 a.m. to 7 a.m., when she will wake up and prepare for the next cycle. In the event of Miss Martin's death, SCP-378 will direct another host to assume her identity. Attempts to interrupt Miss Martin's routine have been unilaterally met with unusual levels of hostility from SCP-378 and its hosts. From Assistant Director Daniela Hayden, Classification Level Rise of 4, Employee Number 134. 2. Director Kelsey Feinstein, Classification Level XK4, Employee Number 87. Regarding, 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 regarding. Identifying current hosts. Date, 2704-1963. Director Feinstein. Mr. Song and Dr. Glass's work have revealed quite a bit about SCP-378. Most importantly, I do not believe it understands the significance of social dynamics, especially in regards to hierarchy and social capital. Several of SCP-378's identities held surprising positions of power. Indeed, Two of them, David Lockheed and Alfonso Liaz, are beyond reach of the Foundation's current capacity to contain. Despite this, SCP-378 has shown a willingness to sacrifice such hosts in order to defend, replace, or otherwise maintain Lisa Martin. Odd, yes, but useful enough. It'd be a shame if something were to happen to Miss Martin and her friends, would it not? SCP-378 is sapient but it by no means understands the significance of its actions. With a little bit of persuasion, David Lockheed might yet ascend from petty paper pusher for the ASCII, right where the Foundation most needs a puppet. And, if I'm not mistaken, spicy crust pizza can always do with a second franchise. Proposal Employing SCP-378's anomalous abilities to defend Foundation operations in the United States. Council vote summary. Approved. Proposal accepted. The Kraken Protocol has been initiated. From Senior Researcher Sang Hun Song, Classification Level Gamma U3, Employee Number 148. 2. Director Kelsey Feinstein, Classification Level XK4, Employee Number 87. Regarding Delays in the Gamma U2677 project. Date 2107 1965. So, good news and bad news, Director. Good news, as I'm assuming you already heard. With the plans for construction of Site 56, all thanks to a certain Mr. Lockheed, the Kraken Protocol's getting a much needed expansion. With its relative proximity to both the Lily of the Valley Nexus and the Pacific Northwest, it's a perfect opportunity to expand the scope of SCP-1000's containment, while ensuring the ASCII doesn't suck LOTV dry before we get to it. For all its oddities, SCP-378 appears to be delighted at the prospect of a change in scenery. I can't imagine a tropical centipede grub likes having a sphere of influence limited to New England of all places, but that's besides the point. 
its A was compliant enough on the way there. Which leads me to the bad news. Rupert Tremont's a fun little guy, agent of the FBI's unofficial Unusual Incidents Unit, and all too stupid to trust Agent Ryans with his drink while he went to the restroom. After that, it's a matter of transport back to Provisional Area 56 in Black Rock, and a centipede down the gullet. Problem comes up when 378 tells us it can't establish a connection. Now, Tremont's still alive, so that's not normal. We run a number of tests, try to figure out what went wrong. And that's when we see a different centipede in his head, where our centipede usually goes. More to come, but I have a bad feeling about this. Item number, SCP-395, Object Class, Euclid, Special Containment Procedures. SCP-395 is to be kept in the center of a locked room at least 10 meters wide. No female personnel are to be allowed into SCP-395's room, under any circumstances. The room is to be guarded by two male personnel at all times. Any unusual behavior should be reported immediately. Any independent movement on the part of SCP-395 should likewise be reported. SCP-395 is to be fed one liter of a half-and-half -half mixture of blood and milk, both taken from the same individual, once a week. Failing to follow a regular feeding schedule will cause SCP-395 to increase its range, at a rate of 10 meters per day without food. If it has not been fed for more than one week past its expected time, it will begin to… Description SCP-395 is a human fetus, approximately seven months into its development, contained in a specimen jar. The jar is filled with a standard formaldehyde solution, with traces of blood. When a female human comes within five meters of the jar, SCP-395 is able to telepathically influence her. At that point, the subject will feel a need to remove SCP-395 from its jar and allow it to feed in the normal manner. All women, regardless of age or medical status, will lactate under this telepathic inducement. Once the milk has been exhausted, SCP-395 will continue to feed, drawing blood and gnawing flesh from the subject. The subject apparently feels satisfaction throughout this process, only understanding what has actually happened when SCP-395 is sated and releases its control. SCP-395 was taken from a traveling freak show whose owner had been using it to control women for his own personal use. It was discovered when police tracked the bodies of his victims back to him. One of the arresting officers fell under SCP-395's control and killed her partner when he attempted to stop her from removing it from its jar. Foundation agents caught the report from the follow-up investigation and acquired SCP-395. Interrogation of SCP-395's owner revealed little. He had acquired it along with the rest of the show from the previous owner's estate. Documentation included with the estate indicated that SCP-395 had been purchased from a teaching hospital in the early 1900s. No information regarding the parents was included. Testing by male personnel shows no detectable life signs while SCP-395 is inside the formaldehyde solution in its jar. Only when a female human subject comes within its range does it become active exhibiting a faint heartbeat and high levels of brain activity. Item number, SCP-400, Object Class, Euclid, Special Containment Procedures. The single colony of SCP-400 in Foundation custody, designation SCP-400-B, is currently housed in a juvenile humanoid containment cell at Site-77's Euclid Objects Wing. Any cell containing an active SCP-400 colony must be secured with an airlock door under biosafety level 4 precautions. Any openings for ventilation must be covered by a metal screen with gaps no greater than 0.2 centimeters in diameter, followed by aerosol filter 400 AF to be changed monthly and remanded to on-site chemical research personnel with level 3 400 clearance. Access for experimentation purposes requires approval from both the Ethics Committee and the item's acting HMCL supervisor, currently Dr. Marshall Grant. SCP-400 handlers are required to wear level 4 positive pressure biohazard suits, 
and must be decontaminated prior to egress. In emergency situations, prevention of olfactory contact with SCP-400 is sufficient to prevent accidental exposure in most cases. For caregiving instructions, please refer to Document 400C Rev 1.3. Agents operating in the continental United States are to report any statistically significant drop in daycare, preschool, and primary school enrollment in their assigned region. Elements of MTF Beta 7, MAS Hatters, are to remain on call for identification, research, and termination of active SCP-400 infestations. Locations found to be infested are to be quarantined using cover story 139B, Bubonic Plague. Media inquiries are to be categorically denied, and all agents of the press demonstrating interest in the quarantine are to be detained and administered a Class B amnestic prior to release. Foundation personnel affected by SCP-400 are subject to quarantine of up to three weeks. If by this time anomalous effects have subsided, personnel are subject to psychological evaluation prior to return to duty. If anomalous effects are still present after the administration of a Class A amnestic, Remaining personnel may be reassigned to non-anomalous research, administrative, and medical positions. Civilians exposed are to be administered a Class A amnestic prior to release. Please refer to Document 401-R for reintegration instructions by geographic region. Damage control for infestations affecting population centers of 500 persons or more may employ amnestic agent NUE-2 locally, if necessary. At least one active SCP-400 colony must be collected from all subsequent infestations and remanded to genetic research personnel with level 3-400 clearance. Description SCP-400 is the collective designation for an anomalous species of arthropod similar to Armadillidium vulgare, or the common pill bug. SCP-400 individuals are morphologically similar to A. vulgare in appearance but can be distinguished visually by bright red striping patterns on their dorsal carapace. Visual identification is only possible by individuals not under the influence of SCP-400's anomalous effects. SCP-400 is a parasitic organism, which feeds on human mammary secretions. Access to this food source is gained by habitation and manipulation of deceased human infants. Affected persons are subject to a Type 3 cognitohazard via a pheromone vector, which repurposes the natural child-rearing instincts present in all humans for its own feeding and protection. Those subject to this effect are unable to perceive SCP-400, or the damage it causes to infants. Exposure to D-Class assets has determined that the effect does not apply to video or audio surveillance and that Level 4 biohazard precautions are sufficient in preventing the effect's onset. Personnel briefed on SCP-400's effects show no special immunity to the false perceptions created by the anomaly. As of 1407-2005, the Ethics Committee has determined that future human experimentation with SCP-400 will only be allowed in unique and dire circumstances. As such, all information regarding SCP-400's relationship with humans and life cycle have been compiled from extensive surveillance and interviews conducted in the site of SCP-400's discovery. Conclusions are based on an observational period, from August 2003 through July 2005. Infestation begins when 25 to 50 instances of SCP-400 select an infant and access its crib. Precise criteria for this selection is unknown. In the seven colonies observed from inception, infant targets were between three weeks and two months of age. Upper and lower age bounds for infestation have not been established. Observation has failed to detect any instance of SCP-400 prior to appearance within the target crib. Parents and D-Class personnel present will be unable to perceive SCP-400. If any person passes within 0.5 meters of the infant, SCP-400 instances will collectively release a fine spray, which causes immediate disorientation and rapid loss of consciousness. SCP-400 will then begin to burrow into the flesh of the sleeping infant. Favored points of entry include the mouth, eyes, anus, navel, and armpits. The infant will not react to the presence of SCP-400 in any fashion suggesting the use of local anesthetics. 
Cardiopulmonary activity in the infant will cease within the first 40 minutes of this procedure, and within three to five hours, movement will resume, followed by strained vocalizations. At this point, the infant is considered an active colony of SCP-400. Incapacitated subjects will awaken soon after the first vocalization and investigate. Parents or other adults present with an earshot will also show interest as per normal for distressed infant vocalization. If the original mother of the colony is present at this time, she will immediately begin breastfeeding, regardless of previous feeding schedule or practices. Over roughly the next 10 weeks, parents and other adults begin to show increased affection and protectiveness toward the colony. During this stage, direct observation by present adults and children will be unable to detect any abnormalities in the colony's physiology, despite numerous dermal perforations and jerky, unnatural movement. The colony is capable of basic vocalization and is able to emulate feeding, defecation, and play behaviors of normal infants with increasing proficiency. Decomposition is still visible via surveillance during this time culminating in desiccation of the colony's remaining soft tissues. It is presumed that the final desiccation is an adaptation of SCP-400, developed to ensure the colony's continued structural integrity. By the end of the twelfth week, all observed colonies exhibited increased size, such that individual instances of SCP-400 are visible moving under the skin. Such colonies are considered mature and individual instances will begin reproductive behavior during this period. During feeding, 7 to 12 SCP-400 individuals will exit the colony through one of its dermal perforations and take hold of any exposed portion of the host mother's skin for approximately 10 minutes before returning. Host mothers studied during this time begin to show increased progesterone production as well as heightened levels of human chorionic gonadotropin indicating an induced pregnancy. After an incubation period of two to three days, host mothers will birth 25 to 50 instances of SCP-400 during her next sleep. Instances of SCP-400 have not been successfully tracked after birth. Maximum interval of dormancy before SCP-400 must initiate another infestation is unknown. After breeding behavior begins, the cycle will repeat once weekly for the duration of the infestation. No natural limit to SCP-400 infestation timeline has been observed. Of recorded infestations to date, all have occurred in the southeastern United States, in rural or mountainous areas, and in some cases, have gone unnoticed for as long as nine months. Improved detection and extermination of SCP-400 instances is considered a high research priority. Addendum 401 Interview 425 Forward 25th in a series of interviews conducted during the infestation of 2003. Mrs. B. Interviewed by Dr. Marshall Grant, Agent Fabian Pertucci observing. Mrs. B. has served as host mother to SCP-400-A and SCP-400-B simultaneously. The advanced state of decomposition suggests the colonies have been active for over two years. She and her deceased twins are considered strong candidates for patient SCP-400-0. At the time of interview, Mrs. B was isolated from SCP-400 for 15 days. Interview conducted on 10-7-2005. Dr. Grant. Good afternoon. How are we feeling today? Mrs. B. Where are my babies? What have you done with my babies? Dr. Grant, your children are being treated for possible bubonic plague exposure, ma'am. They will be returned to you as soon as possible. Mrs. B, subject strikes table. Oh, that's bullshit. You can't keep them from me. You have no right to keep a mother from her children. Tell me where they are or so help me when my husband's lawyers hear of this. Dr. Grant, Mrs. B, we're on your side here. We want to help. If you'll just answer a few questions for me, we'll do everything we can to let you see them this afternoon. Mrs. B, I've already told you on the form. They're three months old, male, names expunged, identical twins, weigh about 10 pounds, 
They don't have any allergies. What more do you want from me? Dr. Grant, you said three months old? When were they born? Mrs. B, February 5th, 2003. Now will you... I'm sorry. I'm just... I love them so much. Never thought I would be much of a mother, but they have been such a joy. After my husband died, subject is silent for 15 seconds. They mean the world to me. I don't know what I would do without them. Not a day goes by, I don't feel blessed. Dr. Grant, I imagine you must. For the record, you're aware of today's date. Mrs. B, it's July the 10th, 2000 fu- Huh, well that's funny. I could have sworn they were only three months. My, time does fly. I must have a picture of them here somewhere. Subject accesses personal effects and produces a portrait of SCP-400-A and SCP-400-B prior to infestation. Here it is. Aren't they just so beautiful? Dr. Grant. Yes, ma'am. Now, has there been anything peculiar about your boys? Mrs. B. Well, there was that time in May when that doctor... No, nothing at all. If anything, they're doing too well. So healthy and full of life. I swear, little said Mama just yesterday. Dr. Grant. I'm sorry, what was that about a doctor? Mrs. B. Yes, he came to the house after they... Three second pause. Subject visibly confused. I didn't say anything about a doctor. Let me see my children, please. They're probably starving by now. They need to be fed. Agent Pertucci. Inaudible to Mrs. B. We're losing her. Come back to it. Dr. Grant. I assure you, ma'am. We're giving them the best care possible. Mrs. B. With that awful formula, I'll bet. <laughs> Threw up the last time I tried that. Neither of them has touched it since. No. It's natural breast milk for them, 100%. My obstetrician said that they'll need it for at least another three months. And I'm not about to take any risks. Dr. Grant, isn't two and a half years a little long to be breastfeeding? Mrs. B, they're, they're only three months old. Dr. Grant, but just now, you had said... Mrs. B, I know what I said. It's your fault. Got my head all turned around. Dr. Grant, I'm sorry if I've confused you, ma'am. It's just... Mrs. B... Who the hell are you people anyway? Let me see my babies! At this point in the interview, Mrs. B refused to answer any further questions and exhibited increased emotional distress and separation anxiety. Post-interview medical examination revealed extensive ovarian and uterine trauma in excess of all other host mothers examined. Mrs. B was administered a Class A amnestic when observations were concluded and is currently under Foundation surveillance as a person of interest. Addendum 402 As of 14-7-2010, SCP-400-A and SCP-400-B have been active in Foundation custody for five years, indicating that colonies may be able to survive indefinitely if continually provided with food. Level 4 biohazard precautions have successfully prevented not only reproduction of SCP-400, but also the spread of all cognitohazardous effects within Site-77. Limited access for experimentation may be granted with approval from the Ethics Committee and SCP-400's HMCL supervisor, currently Dr. Grant. Please allow up to 30 days for review prior to beginning any new line of experimentation. Addendum 403 On 5-10-2010, SCP-400-A ceased activity while in containment after ingesting an experimental nutritional supplement, allowing medical examiners to dissect the colony. Despite desiccation and decomposition, muscle tissues remain responsive to electric stimuli. Highest concentrations of SCP-400 can be found in the stomach, mouth, brain case, and spinal column. Of particular note is the presence of individual specimens periodically along major motor nerves in the extremities, indicating an unprecedented level of communal intellect, utilizing the infant's extant neural architecture. 
Examination of the pheromones produced by individual SCP-400 instances has revealed several hallucinogenic, amnestic, and soporific compounds which are capable of reproducing SCP-400's cognitohazardous effects. Analysis of several compounds has revealed similarities to Class B and C amnestics currently in use by the Foundation, indicating a possible security breach, minimal risk. Aerosol concentrations of the mixture as low as 50 ppm have proven effective in initiating the effect. Further research into the genetic sequencing of SCP-400 is recommended. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.